Hi, everyone. I am Hala Haroni Nicholas, Assistant Professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Neuroscience and a member of the Seaver Autism Center. It's a pleasure for me today to introduce my colleague, Dr. Sylvia Durbais. Uh, she's an Associate Professor at the Seaver Autism Center and also at the Department of Psychiatry. She is a member of the Mindich Child Health and Development Institute and the Free Membrane Institute here at Mount Sinai. She completed her bachelor, master, and PhD degrees in cellular, cellular and molecular biology at the University of Rome, Torvergada, Italy. I hope I spell it right. <laughs> During her PhD and first postdoctoral training in Dr. Claudia, Claudia uh, Bagni's lab uh, in Leuven, uh, I have a problem with spelling those names, Sylvia, uh, Catholic University Leuven yeah. and Lambs Institute for Biotechnology in Belgium. She studied how the regulation of messenger RNA translation shapes the synaptic development in the context of fragile X syndrome. During this training, she visited New York uh, in Dr. Cl Eric Klan's uh, lab uh, in New York University as an EMBO short-term fellow. She then joined Mount Sinai for a second postdoctoral training in uh, Dr. Joseph Baxbaum's lab, where she studied the role of rare genetic variation in autism through large-scale exome sequencing. Uh, Dr. Durabe started her independent, re independent research lab in 2017. Her lab is now focused on understanding the cellular and molecular mechanisms underlying DDX3X syndrome, which we'll, she'll tell us about today. It's a rare genetic condition associated with intellectual disability and autism and manifesting primary in girls. Uh, Dr. Sylvia uh, de Robes, um have got a lot of awards, including uh, the 2020 Friedman Brain Institute Scholar Award and the 2021 Distinguished Social Scholar Award from the Icahn School of Medicine. She has recently also received the Wilhelm Bezel Research Award from the Alexandrian for Humboldt Foundation in 2021. So um, it's a pleasure to have you, Sylvia. And I will just encourage the audience, if they have questions, to put it in the Q&A and not in the chat, please. Thank you, Sylvia. The stage is yours. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction, Hala. Um, I bet you see it all right. Okay, great. So it is really a pleasure to be here today. Uh, thank you, Hala, for, for the introduction. So today I would like to discuss the, the developmental functions of the autism risk gene DDX3X, which is the gene that is the focus of the lab. But before I dive into the specifics of DDX3X, I just want to set the stage for discussing autism spectrum disorder. And for the clinicians in the room who know uh, autism spectrum disorder as a clinical entity better than I do, please bear with me. But for everyone else, I just want to give you a, a, you know, a, a broad picture of ASD and its complexity. So autism affects about 1% of the population, to use a conservative estimate, and is defined as deficits in social communication and interaction, as well as repetitive restricted patterns of behaviors, activity, and interest. And there is already a great degree of heterogeneity in the severity of these core um, deficits, and that yields the definition of a spectrum. Further, to increase complexity, individuals on the spectrum can also have comorbid neurodevelopmental uh, and or psychiatric conditions, including intellectual disability, anxiety disorders, um, ADHD, uh, neurological comorbidities, such as epilepsy, motor problems, hypotonia, and even non-CNS related conditions, for example, gastrointestinal problems or congenital heart defects. And the other element of complexity I'd like to introduce is this profound bias, sex bias in diagnosis, with males four to five times more likely to be diagnosed with autism than females. And I'm intentionally using the verb diagnosed as opposed to affected because there are certainly diagnostic confounders that uh, contribute to this estimate. But I just want to bring up to, to your attention that Fundamentally, ASD has been largely studied in males. And as I'm going to tell you in a second, uh, the, the disorder we focus on is primarily affecting girls. So we, we feel it gives us a chance to understand autism in the female population. So um, alleviate uh, in, inequalities also in patient management and treatment that has been uh, brought up by the fact that ASD has been studied mostly in the male population. So. The gene we focus on, DDX3X, was associated for the first time with neurodevelopmental disorders relatively 
um, recently in 2015 by the work of the Deciphering Developmental Disorders Consortium in UK and uh, shortly after the clinical description by the Clefstra group. And as I alluded to earlier, the, the, the mutations in this gene, and I'm going to tell you what this gene does, uh, but the mutations in this gene affect mostly females. And so you see here uh, a picture of uh, 14 girls with EDXX syndrome and one boy that were seen prospectively uh, at the Siever Autism Center, as uh, Hala was um, alluding to earlier. Um, I'm very lucky to be part of this community where we can integrate preclinical and clinical data so that my colleagues, including Dr. Dorothy Grais at Seaver, uh, are leading clinical studies on the DX syndrome. And so we can have our basic science approaches informed by um, clinical observations. And um, obviously, girls with DDX syndrome, patients with DDX syndrome can have intellectual disability, developmental delay, they can have all spectrum disorder, and can also have congenital brain malformations, including microcephaly, polymicrogyra, genesis or population of the corpus callosum, and motor disorders, including neonatal hypotonia. Um, before I go into this, I need to tell you that ddx x is a gene located on the X chromosome, so you can start already understanding why there are sex biases, but it's not the typical X-linked gene because ddx x escapes X chromosome inactivation, which is a mechanism that has evolved in nature to harmonize the dosage for genes located on the sex chromosome so that females wouldn't have an excess of expression of those genes. And so what I'm showing you here is just uh, data from uh, Daniel MacArthur's lab published in Nature in 2017, where uh, it, it, they, they have estimated the, the percent of genes located on X that escape the surveillance mechanism. And that estimate is about 23%. So what you're seeing here in this heat map is the expression of four X-linked intellectual disability genes across a variety of uh, human tissues. And this is based on 55,000 um, uh, um, 5,500, sorry, transcriptomes um, collected from a little less than 500 individuals across 29 human tissues. So whenever you see, whenever you see a uh, white cell, you're basically saying that that gene is expressing that tissue with similar, at similar levels between female and males. When you see a blue cell that that gene is expressing that given tissue at higher levels uh, in males, and then red cells correspond to higher expression in female tissues than male tissues. And so as you can see here, oligofrenin, for example, undergoes X chromosome inactivation. So overall, there is not much of a bias in expression. Neuroligin for X has a uh, tissue specific pattern, while the non escape gene KDM6A, as well as, as, as our gene of interest, DDX3X, um, ubiquitously have higher expression in female human tissues compared to male tissues. We see something similar in the mouse brain. This is just results of a Western blot for DDX3X in cortices isolated from female mice in blue and male mice in yellow. And so you see this higher expression. And recently from an unbiased proteomics screening, we also found that ddx x is one of the proteins with the highest sex bias ex expression here in uh, female mouse cortical neurons when compared with male mouse cortical neurons. Not only we are having a bias in expression, but we're also having a bias in, a, in the type of ddx x mutations that are identified in female or male patients. So this is a lollipop plot that shows you um, the, the mutations identified, and this is very outdated at this stage, identified in ddx 3 x in females, either in gray or in uh, red, and I'm going to go into that in a second, or in males uh, that you see in blue. And I, I was saying that this is very outdated because uh, the ddx 3 x Foundation, through their registry, now has collated information worldwide, and we know of 800 cases in females and about 30 cases in males. So the mutations found in females that I'm going to call female pathogenic mutations are always de novo. So they're not inherited from mom or dad. They are spontaneous mutations incurring in the gametes. While the mutations found in males are most, not all, but most 
transmitted from healthy, apparently asymptomatic mothers. And in some cases, these mothers have reported a history of recurring miscarriages. In at least a case that was published, the fetus, the aborted fetus was, was tested and had the same mutation of his brother who was born and diagnosed with EDX toxinum. So that is also very interesting to, to think about uh, potential protective factors in these 30 um, male patients diagnosed so far. Um, and while the mutations found in males are invariably mesens mutations, the mutations found in females can either be protein truncating or loss of function mutations. So those are nonsense and frame shift mutations that are thought to lead to upper insufficiency. So loss of one of the two functional alleles of the gene or missense and in-frame mutations. And I'm gonna go again into another level of complexity. So I've, I've shown you a single gene. We're having sex uh, bias in expression. We are having dichotomy in terms of the type of mutations. But even within the female populations, we might be dealing with um, different pathological mechanisms at play. And so there are emerging genotype-phenotype correlations. And this is the work of Elio Scher published a couple of years ago in Neuron, where they had collated uh, medical record information from 107 individuals diagnosed with ddx cdx syndrome. Um, you see the mutations here, uh, all at the top are missense, or at the bottom are frame shift and nonsense. And they started saying that individuals carrying a certain type of missense mutations, including the, the, uh, the blue highlighted here, have a more severe um, clinical outcomes, and they have association with this congenital malformation called polymicrogyra. So when you compare these two groups, non-polymicrogyra individuals and individuals with polymicrogyra, you can see how um, and these individuals all have all these um, missense mutations. You can see how they have they can have more severe outcomes, including a higher rate of microcephaly, hypotonia hypertonia and spasticity, and even, as I was saying, non-CNS um, uh, congenital anomalies, including uh, congenital R defects. Um, and so uh, the, the current thinking in the field is that some of these mutations are leading to a gain of function. And so this brings me to the molecular functions of ddx I have kept you on your toes so far with talking about the molecular functions. So ddx encodes for an RNA ALE case, and the current view in the field is that this RNA leakage is important for mRNA metabolism, but in neurons, it is in particularly important for um, regulating protein synthesis and regulating the synthesis of proteins that are encoded by messenger RNAs that are very highly structured five prime untranslated regions, right? So it cooperates with other LEKs in, in, all, LEKs is in opening up these um, secondary structures. And so when you lose one of the two copies of ddx x as a result of a nonsense of frame shift mutations as reported in the females with the, with the syndrome, you lose the translation of key targets while the missense mutations that are associated with polymicrogyra and at more adverse neurodevelopmental and, and clinical outcomes are thought to lead to the loss of translation of key targets, but also lead to a gain of function and um, uh, result in the formation of these RNA granules where mRNA translation is installed. So you see how even within a monogenic disorder, we are having potentially different pathophysiological mechanisms at play. And so our approach in understanding the dx syndrome, oh, be before I jump into this, I must tell you that I haven't reviewed the literature of the dx uh, functions in uh, neurodevelopment because I can literally summarize it in three main papers. So the dx has been shown to be important for cortical neurogenesis, and we're going to go on to that um, in, in a second. It is important for the formation of the hind brain and the cerebellum, and it is also important for a synaptogenesis and neural outgrowth, and this is really literally everything that is out there. So when we started working on the DX uh, syndrome at the onset of my you know, developing my lab um, in 2017, uh, we thought that we needed very much a model with cost from validity that we could use to understand the DXX syndrome with a multi-tier approach that would go from behavior to identification of circuits to the um, um, narrowing of cellular and molecular mechanisms underlying the syndrome. And so I'm going to tell you how we build this model and uh, how we 
um, showed cost certain phase validity for this model, and that's a largely published uh, work. And then I'm going to show you some pub unpublished data that we feel exciting and so we wanted to um, uh, share within this group. So uh, first disclaimer, the model that I'm going to talk about doesn't necessarily recapitulate all the uh, genetic mutations in ddx x because we designed the model to um, um, mirror, um, mimic loss of function mutations. So we introduced LOXP sites around the second exon of ddx x of the murine locus of ddx x You see that in the human, there are many clinically pathogenic mutations, so increasing the, the relevance of this design for the, the human condition. And then we cross this flux line with the credit leader line that restricts pre-expression and so pre-mediated recombination exclusively to the embryo. And we decided to do so because the work of the work of the Chen group had shown that ddx rex is fundamental for the formation of the placenta. So we really wanted to leave the placenta unperturbed and make sure that every phenotype we would see would primarily depend on ddx rex knockout in, in, in the embryo. And so this recombination happens during gastrulation and affects all tissues. So when we made these crosses, we were expecting for four genotypes, and I'm always going to say the same uh, color code throughout my, my presentation. So we were expecting to see control males, control females in yellow and blue, respectively, haploinsufficient females. So these would be females who have lost one of the two copies of the dx -Rex. So uh, in terms of cost validity, this would be close to female with, DDX, with, with mutations that are leading to loss of one of the two copies, so non-sensor frame, frame shift mutations. And then no male mice. We immediately observed that the nose were not born, and this was consistent with previous report by the Chang group showing that um, complete ablation of ddx 3 x uh, constitutively um, is embryonic lethal. And then we just verified that the insufficient females were indeed up insufficient by showing that they had reduced ddx 3 x mRNA levels compared to uh, the control female litter mates and reduced protein levels. And again, here you see this bias in expression both at the mRNA and at the protein level. So, so far, so good. This is a model of upload insufficiency for ddx 3 x so the first thing that we wanted to understand was the longitudinal trajectory, the developmental trajectory these animals were on. And so we ran a lot of um, tests to really capture if and how the mutant females were meeting um, physical sensory and motor milestones. So even just measuring their weight, we saw that there was a, a delay in, uh, in growth. As you can see here in red, these are our ddx up upper insufficient female pups. And this delay in growth is persists in adulthood as low body weight, as you can see here. And so this is reminiscent of the failure to throw that is the failure to thrive that is often observed in um, patients with ddx rex syndrome. The physical delays are not limited to growth. We also see a delay in eye opening. Again, you can notice the shift of this curve, of this red curve um, towards later in time. And this delay in eye opening was then translated into a delay in responding to visual cues, as you see here, right? Simply because at this age, the animals, um, many of the animals are not completely open their eyes. And talking about the sensory piece, um, we did not see all the changes in response to visual cues, but also delay in responding to auditory cues here and in responding to tactile cues. And this is very important because individuals with EDX syndrome, and I would say uh, perhaps across the board in individuals with ASD have um, that, that are report of hyper-responsivity or hyper-responsivity, right? So there are clearly changes in um, sensory processing, even in the patient population. The motor piece, as I was saying, is very important for DDX syndrome. Uh, um, um, especially hypotonia is something that uh, often in um, pediatric settings and even neonatology settings raise concerns and prompts uh, families and, and um, clinicians to uh, do genetic testing. And so we measure here surface riding, which is the time that it takes for a pup to flip on the four poles from a supine position. And so it's a roughly a measure of hypotonia. And so you can see how the DDX rex upload sufficient female pups uh, for them, it takes longer to be able to complete this flip. 
And we also see that they have a delay in um, this um, outcome, this motor outcome called negative geotoxis, which is an innate behavior that um, when animals are placed head down on a 45 degree slanted surface, lead them to same place, turn and walk all the way up, counteracting uh, vestibular cues of gravity. So as you can see, the DDX, 3 x have insufficient females have a delay, and just they, they keep sliding down again because of, of the hypotonia. Okay, so what we are saying, looking early, you know, during the first 21 postnatal days is a, de is a delay in meeting uh, physical sensory and motor milestones. And so in independent course of animals, we also tested adult behavior to really capture um, uh, um, phenotypes that may be salient to the um, behavioral abnormalities that are seen in the patient population. So the very first pass was open field where we are measuring the locomotor activity as well as their thigmotaxis. So they respond to avoid the center zone of exposure and so avoid uh, predators. And so what we saw is that the dx 3 x sufficient female um, mice uh, had uh, were moving more in spite of the motor delays that they had post early postnatally. And also they had an increased latency to enter the center zone. They were sort of hesitant in entering the center zone and that they had increased thigmotaxis. So they were sticking to the walls more. Once they were in the center zone, they would leave the center zone. They would spend less time in the center zone. So this is reflective of an hyperactivity behavior. And as you may remember, individuals with um, ddx 3 mutations can be diagnosed with ADHD. And this is a, um, a reflective of an anxiety-related behavior. And again, especially in the uh, pubertal population, there is report of anxiety disorders um, in the ddx 3 uh, female population. We're now very interested in understanding what the neural underpinnings of these uh, manifestations are. And so together with the lab of Joao Hu here at Mount Sinai, we are leveraging uh, a methodology called iDisco to really visualize recent neural activity upon sort of behavioral tasks and so dissect circuits. So this is a method that uh, Joao developed when it was in Mark Tessier Lavin's lab at Rockefeller. It's called iDisco and I will not even try to remember the act what is an acronym for, but fundamentally it is the combination of the lipidation of tissue to limit diffraction, so make the tissue optically transparent, and you see it here, right? This is the brain before and after, and you can see now the grid underneath, and that gets combined with deep diffusion of antibodies so that we can do immune stainings and lysine microscopy, so that we can visualize um, expression of any, any given protein uh, three-dimensionally in the brain. And so for us, we are uh, using this approach to detect um, expression of the immediate early gene CFOS, again, as a proxy of recent neural activity. And so um, I'll show you that. I just want to tell you that Again, as a first pass, we're doing the days after open field, but open field over 30 minutes is a lot of locomotor activity, right? So we wanted to reduce um, uh, really to the element of uh, novelty evoked response. And so we have been running the open field just for the first 10 minutes. And uh, I just want to reassure you that even within the first 10 minutes, we see this increased uh, latency to enter the center zone and reduced time spent in the center zone. And so this is our experimental design where we have the group exposed to open field for 10 minutes, as I just showed you, and then they go back to their home cage for 35 minutes. And so after 45 minutes from the onset of the test, the, the animals are euthanized, tissue are collected, uh, cleared with iDisco, that methodology that I've showed you early, and stained for CFOS. And as a control group, we use a naive group that just doesn't undergo uh, open field. So what I'm showing you here is a vision, it's a view from a top of a 3D brain, uh, immunostain clear with iDisco and immunostain for CFOS uh, in the control group. So these are animals not exposed to open field and these are animals exposed to this exploration of the open field. And so you can see already the activation, right? Of um, pretty much widespread activation. And so this is just in control wild type animals. Um, oh, and I should say here that these data are very preliminary, uh, but, you know, I was just too excited not to show them. Um, and again, we're not making strong conclusions yet because we will be quantifying this also using uh, ClearMap, a um, analytical framework that uh, was developed again by colleagues of Zhuhao. But 
you know, just wanted to give you a glimpse on how we can uh, go one level down uh, behavior. And so this is what we are saying in the DDX CREX supplement insufficient females. Again, the naive, not exposed to open field and uh, upon open field. And so what we're beginning to see is an overactivation of the amygdala here pointed by the yellow arrow and a dampening of the activity in the um, cerebral cortex. So as I said, very preliminary and we are in the process of quantifying this. Other behaviors that I wanted to emphasize, because I think they are important also to um, see where we are going when we think about circuits, our motor behaviors, as I said, these are very prominent in the patient population. And so we have tested motor function with a variety of assays. I'm just going to show you one of them. So this is vertical pole where we are measuring here the time that it takes for a mouse to turn on, a, on the top of a pole and descend from the pole. And so you see animals, adult animals of four months that they have, you know, that begin to have deficits in the ability of coordinating this response, this descent from the pole. And then we ask whether this uh, motor dysfunction could be worsening with time. And the reason for that is because we really have no idea of what the natural history of DDX sex syndrome is. So longitudinal studies are just beginning to uh, be put in place. But we know of a report of a 40. Five, 47, sorry, um, year old woman with DDX syndrome who had late on some neurological decline. And so we wanted to check in the mice if there was any sign of deterioration of the motor function. And so we checked separate cores of animals, a, se a separate core of animals at uh, one year of age. And we saw that not only now the animals had problems descending, but they also had difficulties turning on the pole. These animals, though, had never been exposed to behavioral challenges before. So we were curious to see whether exposure to prior, um, so prior behavioral training could somehow uh, deviate this trajectory of decline. And so we tested these uh, same animals at one year of age. And so these are animals that had undergone uh, behavioral training, including, for example, Rodarod, and I'm not showing you the results today, but they are, these are all published. And so what we saw here is that effectively prior exposure to behavioral training alleviated, if not completely prevented, this motor decline. Um, so going again one step down behavior, as I said, for us, behavior is a proxy to try and figure out what the underlying circuits are. And so in this published study, what we did was also taking a very unbiased look at uh, volume changes, right, in uh, the brains of the DX example, insufficient females. And we did this in collaboration with Jason Lurch and looking at MRI at postnatal day three. So this is a postnatal stage. We are not looking at ad adults. What we saw was about a 10% reduction in brain volume that, however, is not a true microcephaly phenotype because it's just in line with the fact that these animals are smaller. They, they have, as I've showed you, um, uh, you know, a, a growth delay. But even within this 10% reduction, there were certain brain regions that were disproportionately smaller, right? You see the amygdala, and I pointed at that earlier um, um, when I showed you the ID score results, but also the cerebral cortex. And I've showed you also that the cerebral cortex has issues in activation. So we're very interested in understanding how the cortex is developing in these animals, because individuals with DDX syndrome can have congenital malformations that suggest that cortical development is going is, is aberrant, right? Uh, and so this is cortical, this is just a cartoon very simplified of cortical development in mouse. Um, there are obviously very important spe species specific differences in this when we think about uh, human cortical development. Uh, but just, you know, at a first glance, we basically have neural progenitors, radial gear proliferating, generating postmitotic neurons that migrate through the cortical plate, acquire their self identity, and then um, derive these populations of glutamatergic projection neurons that connect different regions of the cortex or the cortex with subcortical targets. And so, as I've alluded to earlier, ddx has been shown to be important for cortical neurogenesis in mouse. This is the work of Debbie Silver's lab showing that when a, um, a DDX-3X is downregulated in utero, um, in um, 
mice at embryonic stage, at embryonic day 13.5, and then um, uh, populations are checked at embryonic day 15.5, what they saw was that the ddx tdx regulation was leading to an increase in progenitors, in the pool of progenitors, at the expenses of postmitotic um, neurons. So indicating that ddx tdx mutations reduce um, a neurogenesis, right, the formation of these postmitotic neurons. However, we did not know back then whether all populations might be equally affected, and also what one might be, you know, DDXX might be involved also in other steps, and so what would be the resulting in terms of populations uh, within the cortex? So as, as I said, again, this is very simplified, but just, uh, you know, in the deep layers of the cortex, this beautiful six layers of architecture, in the deep layers you have neurons projecting largely uh, under the cortex, so subcortically, including corticothalamic projection neurons in layer six and um, subcerebral projection neurons in layer five, going to the spine, to the pons, to the striatum. And then upper layers are rich with intradelencephalic projection neurons projecting either to the ipsilateral cortex, to so the ipsilateral side of the cortex, or contralaterally um, through, for example, the corpus callosum. And so we started investigating in the ddx 3 um, uh, brains if there were uh, you know, differences in the density or in the localization of these different populations, because this is this is published. I'm just going to show you a piece of data that is going to be important, I think, to understand another piece of data that is uh, unpublished. And so we started by uh, looking at, you know, these, these populations of subcerebral projection neurons in layer five that can be identified as positive to this molecular, molecular marker here called CDIP2, and also intradelencephalic projection neurons that are mostly upper layer and that are um, uh, labeled by this molecular marker called BRN1. And so here, what you're seeing is the primary motor cortex of control females and control, uh, and sorry, and uh, DDX rex haploid sufficient females are postnatal day three. And uh, you can see these populations, and you, as you can probably appreciate already by eye, and then see even further in the quantification, we are basically having the CDP2 positive subcerebral projection neurons extending deeper than what you would normally see in a, in a controlled brain. And uh, particularly when we look at these populations of neurons, what we are seeing is a surplus of neurons that have this dual identity, right? So typically, uh, neurons should, you know, expression of these two markers, CDIP2 and BRN1, would be mutually exclusive because they are leading to distinct fates, either project subcortically or project within the cortex. However, we show here, and it's been shown before by the, by the Rakic lab, that there is a very, a, you know, a minority of neurons that have both, um, uh, that are expressing both markers. So in wild type brains, this is about 5% of the population. And so in our mutants, we see a surplus of these uh, CD neurons that are also positive to BRN1. So we're now very interested in understanding what is the nature of these neurons, where they're projecting to. And so a lot of experiments we are doing right now is, again, in collaboration with Zhuhao, is mapping cortical connections. And this is an example of what we have done so far, where we are mapping corticopontin projection neurons by injecting uh, in the pontine reticular nucleus a retrograde adenovirus that expresses GFP. So three weeks after, and this is just a simple immune staining, but three weeks after in the sagittal section, you can see how the cortical neurons that were projecting to the pons uptake at an uptake of these virus that travel all the way back to the cortical neurons. And you see that these neurons are largely CD2 positive, right? Everything is expected. So in the actual experiments, three weeks after we collect the tissues, clear them with ID squares I've shown you earlier and perform light sheet microscopy, also in combination with immunostains. And so what you're seeing here is a view from a top of a 3D brain, so this is not a section. This is not a uh, you know a um, section. It's really the 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 view from atop, from the anterior posterior axis. You see the olfactory bulbs here of these beautiful corticopontin projection neurons, right? And so we can map their location. We can also look at them in terms of single cell. Uh, um, uh, morphology. And uh, again, very preliminary, but too excited not to share. We are beginning to see changes in the uh, 
in the in the projection that these neurons are forming. So overall, if we were to compare controls and upload insufficient female brains, the overall map of this corticopontin projection zero and their main afferents are intact. And this is unsurprising because these mice are anyway walking and their locomotor activity is grossly intact. However, what we see are ectopic collaterals. So um, secondary branches of the axon collaterals that are reaching out back to the, to the um, cortex and contacting other corticopontin projections. What this exactly means functionally, we don't know yet, but remember that we see motor delays in these animals, we see motor deficits. And also remember that we see that CD2 neurons, there is a surplus of CD2 neurons that are also BRN1 positive. So we're very curious to understand whether some of these ectopically projecting neurons might be doing that because of this dual identity, right? Sort of a confused um, um, cell fate. Okay, I, I should have shown this arrow earlier. Okay, and then another step that I would like to mention is always thinking about the way these neurons are developing and the way they are acquiring cell fate and the way they're also forming axons and dendrites that will ultimately lead them to be able to connect, right, with other neurons. And so uh, this is, a, again, a published work from Adele, in the, from Adele in the lab, where she is looking at the dendrogenesis in a cell autonomous fashion. So for this purpose, we're, we're turning to uh, primary cortical cultures from um, embryos at day 15 and looking separately at female and male neurons. So this approach also help us dissect the, the role of sex which we cannot do with our mice, given that the um, male nodes are embryonic lethal. So she basically grows uh, primary cortical neurons from um, uh, wild-type females, wild-type males in magenta and blue, respectively, as well as flocks, uh, females and flocks males in pink and cyan. And then at days in vitro zero, so the day of plating, she's transpecting these neurons with a bisistronic construct that carries them cherry to visualize the, the, you know, the outline of the neuro and create that will induce recombination and lead each of these genotypes to begin again, control females, upload insufficient females, control males and upload insufficient females and upload insufficient and uh, no males. And then she looks by shell analysis at the morphology of these neurons at this in vitro nine. Again, here the transfection is very sparse. So we're looking at cell autonomous effect. And here just to show you that we can make sure that the neurons are not longer expressing the VX rex. So this is, again, the, the four different genotypes and the neurotransfected with them cherry and uh, reduction of DDX rex, which you can't really appreciate much by monostenin, but complete loss in the null neurons. And then, as I was saying, she performs shoal analysis to look at the dendritic carburization. And so in this plot, um, we are looking at the branching points as a function of the distance from the soma. And we can we begin to see even differences between female and male control neurons. But the most robust and dramatic effect is in the uh, male null neurons, where we're really having a uh, oversimplification of the dendritic carburization. As I said, this is preliminary. We are collecting more data, and you have the numbers here of the individual neurons and individual embryos. And when we unpack this data in terms of, you know, where is the complexity being lost? We are seeing a very robust change in the number of secondary dendrite and tertiary dendrites in no male neurons here in cyan compared to control male neurons. And we're even beginning to see sex specific differences in terms of uh, in, the, in the female sex, right? So for example, DDX uh, uh, loss in the female neurons, upload insufficient in the female neurons, paradoxically increases the number of secondary and tertiary dendrites. Okay, so just a summary of everything that I've shown you. We, we're really interested in this longitudinal and developmental trajectory, right? And so for the, for the characterization of the mouse model, we have seen delays in, in meeting physical sensory motor milestones, followed by hyperactivity and related behaviors. I haven't shown you about memory deficits and motor impairments. And this is accompanied, at least our initial data suggests that is accompanied by abnormal neural activity and abnormal cortical projection. The motor function also seemed to decline, but apparently uh, prior behavioral exposure alleviates or modifies the course of this trajectory. And all of these developmental and behavioral changes are preceded by 
changes in brain volume, altered cortical lamination, and uh, Debbie Silver's data also show altered cortical neurogenesis, and Adele's data now show altered endogenesis. So I'm just gonna conclude by thanking all the people involved in, in the work. I feel very lucky of having a uh, you know, group of um, junior scientists, budding scientists who are very inspiring and inspired. And so the work that I've presented with the mouse model has been led by Andrea, but not in uh, an alumna in the lab who's now at UT Southwestern continuing the work on EDXCX and attempting to do uh, G to assess feasibility for gene therapy. Um, in the Grace lab, and Marta Garcia Forn, a very talented postdoc in the lab. Uh, and then the data that I've showed you, the last piece of data on the dendrogenesis uh, was led by another very talented postdoc in the lab, Adele, uh, together with the help of Yeji. Michael is now examining the, de the, the destiny and the fate of these CD2 positive, VRN1 positive um, neurons. And, you know, we are also very lucky that we have a lot of people interested in working with us, undergrad students, um, even high school students, and all of our collaborators and all of our founders. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, I want to encourage the audience, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or use the Q&A and I will read them. Sylvia, I can't pretend that I don't know all of this yeah. already by heart. I heard it many times and I ask, uh, you know, um, I got the answers for my questions previously, but I was curious actually about, um, so, and, and excuse me that this is not like exactly what you're currently doing, but the game yeah. of function mutations yes. with the aggregation of the RNA, uh, I don't know yeah. how you call them. RNA granules, yeah. Granules. Um, is this something that has been shown in animal models or uh, only in cell so, culture? So right now, so the, the first mouse model with a missense mutation has just been made available through the Jackson lab. So no one has ever looked at a mouse with, with a missense mutation. So we don't know. The answer is that we don't know because also the, you know, you raise an important point. The RNA granules were fundamentally seen in overexpressing these mutants, right? So mm -hmm. how much of that depends upon the, the, the levels of expression of this protein in you know, yeah. progenitors or neurons. Um, so the, the concept there would be that because of the stalling of the messenger RNAs, that there is somehow, but this has not been you know, dynamically dissected, there is somehow the formation of these RNA granules. Whether they are stress granules or P bodies, I think is still unclear. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a readout that has also been used to draw correlations between, um, at, you know, more severe phenotypes and a sort of a mole molecular biomarker. And so what the group of uh, Debbie Silver and Elio Cher has shown is that those mutations that are associated with polymicrogyra, they also induce the formation of these granules. But to answer, you know, your question, whether this has been seen in the mouse, has not been done in the mouse yet. All right, so this has been established in, in uh, cell cultures from patients. Right, right. yeah. No, uh, in, in cell lines and also um, and 2 a which are, you know, mouse lines, but has not been done in, in a mouse with that mutation, in with that, that mutation endogenously, right? It's always mm. an exogenous expression. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And in, uh, in, in your question, of, you know, you, you were asking also patient-derived lines. Uh, we don't know that yet either. Okay. If the RNA granules are seen in patients carrying those mutations, at least has not been published. Do we believe that some of the human subjects have this phenotype or this? Um... The RNA granules? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think we have data to say that. Thank you. There is a question from Hero. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great talk. Do brain volume cortical laminar changes in uh, mutant persist in the adult? Was going to ask That's about a great the question. Well. So we haven't done MRI in the in the adults. We have just checked the levels of the CD2, the the density of the CD2 positive neurons in the adults, and we see a reduction, a slight reduction. Um, so I, yeah, I I don't know if so. If you look though, in the in the IDSCO data, if you if I don't know if we can go back, but like looking at the IDSCO data, you actually see 
that the, the brains of the DDX3X female mice are smaller than the control. So I, I would expect that by MRI, you would also see, you know, an overall reduction and probably even a, uh, a disproportional reduction in the cortex, but we haven't done those experiments in adult stages. Got it. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I hope so. If Hira has a follow-up, he can also put it in the Q&A. Uh, Matthew Lally says that RNA oh, yeah. Cells, yeah have been seen in human tumors with DDX3X yeah. mutations. Um, it's, it's interesting. So there are cases where DDX3X leads to tumors, but not uh, the same yeah, so, so there are there are reports. So this is not necessarily in the same patients patients with DDX yeah. mutations. I know uh, that there are a few sparse cases of individuals with DDX mutations also developing um, tumors. And again, here I don't want to be misspeaking because I don't think that we have solid published data to support that. But there are uh, uh, cases of tumors that have somatic mutations in ddx right? So not germline mutations. And so this is what Matt is referring to, that in, in these, um, you know, ca cancerous tissues with somatic mutations in ddx they, they have shown the have shown the formation of the granules. That's interesting. And in, in, uh, uh, if we think about longitudinal, longitudinal studies, if... Uh, those mice or the patient yeah, would develop. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we I, I have, think we have, do we have adult patients? Uh, yeah. So that's what we don't know. So the, the longitudinal piece is not quite there. There are adult patients, but um, I think, again, I don't want to be misspeaking here, but I think the next approach for that is cross-sectional. So looking at different ages as compared to following the same patient over time. Um, so I think there is also going to be an interest in recruiting more adolescents and even you mm -hmm. know, young adults and adults. Um, uh, as, as it pertains to the mice, we don't see, you know, um, if, if it matters at all, but we don't see changes in longevity. So these and our mutant animals can reach the age of two years old, no problem. Mm -hmm. So we don't see the, you know, a, a decrease in the lifespan. We actually aimed at examining these animals at two years of age, but that coincided with the shutdown imposed by the pandemic. So these animals, unfortunately, we lost them during that phase, but we were able to examine the motor behaviors in the one-year-old and in even 1.5-year-old. Um, overall, you know, it's not that we went to an, and look for formation of tumors, but overall, we don't see that these animals are doing, are, are not doing well. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. not, there were no overall changes in appearance that would you know, prompt us yes, to yeah. do exam, examinations. Yeah. So overall, they were indistinguishable from, from their leader mates, from their control leader mates. There is a, a question by Justin. Uh, is there evidence that the syndrome is degenerative? And uh, okay, maybe I'll also read yeah. uh, the other question by Justin. Yeah. The decline in mobility that was found in older mice has also been found in patients. So actually, yeah. it's a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I was saying, right? That fundamentally we do not know because there are no, um, um, there is no data collected in in the adult patient population. What prompted us to check the animals at uh, later stages was this one report from a paper published by uh, the Baylor group, um, I wanna say in 2019, the Wang's paper that was reporting this um, loss of the, you know, a basically that this 47 year old woman had become nonverbal and, and lost the, the use of the arms. So prompted by this, Mm. might be an anecdotal observation we check the animals but there is no more organic data uh, you know data for the for the adult population so this is what we were just discussing that i think it's going to become more and more important to also look at uh, clinical phenotypes in adolescents young adults and adults I, I, I'm not sure. I guess you kind of covered the other question, whether the syndrome is degenerative. I guess we still don't have that exactly. uh, kind of data. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I wonder if there are any hints that might suggest that. Not that I know of. 
All right. If anybody has any other question, I think I, yeah, I think we covered all questions in the Q and A and the chat. Um, yeah. So thank you, Sylvia. Thank you thank very you much. Very much. So. Very, very exciting work. And if anybody has any follow up questions, feel free to reach. I, I volunteer in, on your behalf to reach out to Sylvia by email. Absolutely. You can find my email address easily. All right. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank, thanks, everyone, for attending. Yeah. Bye.